Welcome to the show. I'm Dom Dumas, and I'm in Bangkok. I'm also the official podcaster of the SHL. Freelance Writing with Rachel Beard, episode 53. Welcome to the show, Rachel. Thank you. Very lovely to be here. So, before we get too far into freelance writing, uh, I want to know some about some things about you. Like, where are you from? Well, I'm from a little country called Texas. A little country? Yeah. Yeah, it is a, it's a little bit of country. <laughs> Not where I'm from, though. I'm from the city. So, like, it wasn't until I was much older in life that I actually went out into the country, and then I realized what Texas was all about. Okay. Didn't realize that until... Actually, Example. and going... I need examples. Okay. I've never been to Texas myself. Not yet, anyway. It's a crying shame, son. <laughs> so, I went to boarding school in New England, and I remember going up there and people said, you know, because most people were from New England who went up to the school, and I remember going up there and, oh, you're from Texas? I thought I could hear that accent. I'm like, the accent? You guys have the accents, as a matter of fact. You know, this New York the Boston accent and I just I they don't have that in Connecticut. they have an accent but that's not the accent well they have there were some there were definitely some kids up there from like Worcester you yeah. know and they actually talked like that I'm like yes. I didn't think people talk like that in real life I thought that was just caricature for movies but oh no you should, I was blown away you should hear how we talk in northern Minnesota Minnesota <laughs> don't you know what you've been up to we're going out to the farm this weekend what about you eh yeah <laughs> No, I, um, yeah, I learned that I had an accent and that apparently I rode a horse to school when I was younger because I'm from Texas. Oh, you mean you didn't? Well, there were a couple couple of years of hardship without the car. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah, but, (laughs) yeah, so, you know, I learned all these things about myself being from Texas that I actually had to leave Texas to learn. So, yeah, like the fact that. Yeah, riding horses. I had a cowboy hat, apparently, in my wardrobe. But I bet you do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I just I maybe have, I have this feeling. <laughs> so if I ever come on again, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring that with me. Okay, I'm well, surprised I you my, didn't bring it. My son, I don't have a cowboy hat. How can you not have a cowboy hat? I don't know. I should look into that. Okay, the next time I go back to Texas, I'm gonna buy a cowboy hat and I'm gonna pick you one up too. I bet I could find a place in Bangkok that has them. You probably could, but it wouldn't be from Texas. This is true. It wouldn't be a 10-gallon hat. <laughs> yeah. No, you got to have, like, the authentic... Yeah, the authentic hat. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you are from Texas, but you went to school in Con- in New England, Connecticut. Yeah. Okay. I was a boarding school brat. <laughs> I'm just going to let that die right there because, like... I'm a public school guy, so... Oh, dear. Oh, yeah. we're sitting at the same table. It's awkward. <laughs> yeah. Maybe for some people, but... <laughs> yeah. No, I... It was a really cool experience, and I... I don't know. I mean, I look back on those types of things, because I took my first year of university in Alaska, for example, mm-hmm. and... Um, wow. Talk about some big contrasts. I mean, Texas, New yeah, England, Alaska... seemed like a good idea at the time, until the first winter... Why am I here? And you had like six months of darkness. Oh, it was so depressing. But actually, I lived in Scotland also for five years. And I remember in the wintertime, at three o'clock, it was pitch black outside. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine. Well, and then in the the summertime, it was the opposite. It never got dark. So the way it looks outside and right and now, it was Al- like that. Are you talking one about the... Alaska or Scotland now? Well, where I was living in Alaska trying to think what the latitude would be it was south of anchorage so it wasn't like fairbanks or something that's way up getting the complete darkness and stuff it wasn't Mm -hmm. like that thank god but um yeah but it was really beautiful up there because we lived where i lived there was the ketchumac bay it was Mm -hmm. a town called homer okay there's a ketchumac bay that goes across like this and then there's this mountains with this glacial range it was so beautiful but yeah just a completely different world from what i'd come from so yeah. yeah yeah I mean, when I when I went to Connecticut, it was a completely different world for me from Minnesota. Well, I went. I grew up in Minnesota. Um, my last years of high school were in Hudson, Wisconsin. Yep. Um, then I went to Connecticut. Hugely different world. Yeah. Um, 
through Chicago, obviously, I did my, this was when I was in the Navy, so I did my, uh, I did my, uh, sorry, I had a, a buzz, I had to fix it, so I did my uh, boot camp in uh, Great Lakes. Oh, okay. And they call it Great Mistakes. Great Mistakes. Yeah, because, you know, you made a mistake. Uh, and then I went to Connecticut, and then I went from Connecticut. I tried to stay in Connecticut because yeah. I actually loved it. It uh, is. I, I like. I think New England's got a lot of really neat charm. I love mm-hmm. Boston. Yeah, I think Boston's a really neat city, um, and it's beautiful countryside up there. It really mm-hmm. is. You know, and the further north you get, it's just, it's kind of like Texas in a way because it's kind of the, you know, that really rural countryside. You know, you and need it, to see Minnesota. We have Minnesota. big, yeah. We have big cities, you know. Yeah, and and uh, one or two. Well, one, though we have the one. Twin Cities area, okay, which is I've flown through that, that airport, uh, Saint uh, Minneapolis, Saint Paul. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have the Twin Cities, which is like the two, the capital, and then the city that's actually bigger than it. Yeah, and all the cities that are kind of in the outskirts, they call mm-hmm. it the Twin Cities area. Right, they're, right. They're fairly big, um, but then. When you get away from there, obviously they get the cities get smaller. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like the city I'm from, uh, it is the the county seat, but it has two thousand people. Wait, I can top that. So I'm from Houston, which is about seven million people. Uh huh. And I met my husband, and he's like, "Let's go up and meet my family." I'm like, "Yay! I've never been that far up in the world." So go up to Michigan, and we're standing on a street. He's like, well, this is the town. I'm like, where? He's like, you're looking at it. I'm like, I see a house and a boat. Where's a town? It was population 200. <laughs> I, I've got to beat. Oh, okay. All right, let's hear it. Okay, there's a little town in between Roseau and Warroad. Yeah, what is the name? Warroad. War Road. Yeah, you know where T.J. Oshie is Makes from? Makes me think of, like, the War Grider in Lord of the Rings. You know where T.J. Oshie is from? Yeah. That's War Road, Minnesota. Oh. Yes. It, it population? Is the, uh, population is probably about 3,000. It's a little bit bigger than Roseau. But there's a town in between there called Salo. Okay. You Seriously, if you blink, you miss it. Yeah. It, has, it used to have a church. It has a bar. And it has a strip of roads. There's yeah. not even a school. Okay. Um, the reason I say they it used to have a church, the church burnt down. Oh. And they just didn't rebuild it. So there's Heathens. a bar and like five houses. Yeah. Jeez. But the bar stays open. Yes. Actually, absolutely. in this town that my husband's from, it's called Curtis, and they have, their grocery store went out of business, but their bar is like thriving. Of course. You know. What else you got to do? Well, and then they have a hardware store. So the grocery store that got that went out of business is now a hardware store, and there's like five bars, and they're always packed because <laughs> all of the population of the town is in these five bars. So it's a it's a small town. What, what was the? It was like this the place in Homer where I live. They said it's a fishing town or no? Sorry, sorry. The place it's where? a drinking town. The, wait, wait. With the a place where problem. it sounded to me like you said the place you Homer? from Homo. I was like, what? Homer. Oh, Homer. Alaska. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that was a, dr- uh, a, f- a drinking town with a fishing problem. Okay. And that was actually Curtis, too. It's a drinking town with a fishing problem. I can understand. Population 200. Wow. So you, you go to Connecticut, and then what? you went to Alaska for yep. one year of university. Yep. And then what? And then I came back and finished university. Came back to... Texas. Okay. And then, um, yeah, came back to Texas, finished university, then got married, and then I moved to another country called Louisiana. <laughs> yeah, Louisiana is a whole oh, other. It's actually quite interesting because in the U.S., if you're, I was pre-law in, in university, and if you get, if you go to law school in the U.S., any of the states, you know, I think Alaska and Hawaii probably count. I don't know, they're off there, so. In Louisiana, they practice Napoleonic law, which is a completely different legal system. Like, okay. they have different penal code and everything. So, wow. you can't actually... I'm not, I'm not sure if you have to go to law school. No, that's not true. 
I don't know. I'm going to fact check that and continue this conversation okay. at a later date. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But um, there's this Interstate 10, which goes from Jacksonville, Florida, to Los Angeles. Okay. And so it cuts right through, cuts right through Texas, cuts right through Houston. And you can always tell, even if you fall asleep at the wheel, you know, and you're driving like this, you can always tell when you hit the Louisiana border because the road goes from this to this. <laughs> there's a few states like that. <laughs> It's really bad. And, you know, it was only 220 miles from Houston to Lafayette. and Well, they figure they need to keep you awake somehow. Well, you know, that and the gambling. Like, let's get off this road and go gamble. Hey, there we go. So, but they talk like this in Louisiana. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my gosh, these are like proper Southern folk. You know, in in Texas, we're just pretending because we... You know, we don't talk like you. You sound so posh. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of a story I'll tell you about another time. Go back to Tara, Scarlet. <laughs> Georgia, Louisiana, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, I should bring out the Texas accent more often. That's kind of fun. That wasn't Texas. <laughs> yeah, whenever I go back, suddenly the y'all bomb starts coming out again. And my kids will look at me like, what are you talking <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Mommy, are you okay? It's all right, kids. We're just in Texas now. This is how y'all talk here. <laughs> I sometimes pull out a, a, a southern drawl. Really? How? How? Um, Wannabes. Yeah, pretty much. But it's funny. Uh, some people say it's good. Some people obviously say it's horrible. But okay, let's hear it. Go on. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, it's, well, you yeah. can't just throw it out there and not tell me now. You gotta say something. <laughs> Like what y'all want me to say. <laughs> Sweetheart, I think you just did a great Forrest Gump impression. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, he's from down south. Don't quit your day job, okay? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you, you went back to Texas. and yep. you, Is that where you finished up university? Or? Yep. Okay. I and went then... to Cougar High. That's what University of Houston's called because our mascot's a cougar. Okay. Uh, so I'm you a know, cougar. In Minnesota, it's a gopher. The that Golden just Gophers. Sound terrifying. Were you guys undefeated or defeated all the time? No, we actually have quite a good football team and hockey team. Big Ten. Well, I don't know. You should look into changing the mascot, though. A gopher just—it sounds. Actually, my boarding school was a griffin, and I thought that was pretty cool. The, oh, griffin, yeah. Okay. Yeah, griffins are cool because yeah. they're mythological creatures. So exactly that makes it even cooler because you can make up anything that you want them to do, right? Exactly. It's the tame lion. With the eagle head. So you you finish school. Yeah. Sorry, get back on track here. So you finish school. Yeah. And, and then what? And get then married I got and married. Pop out a few puppies. Yeah. Okay. They weren't puppies though. They were of the human variety. Okay. And they're pretty cute. So I have three of them. Okay. And they're five, seven, and nine. And um, actually, we went to this uh, the American Chamber of Commerce here in Bangkok puts on um, an American Independence Day thing mm-hmm. which was two weeks ago i guess so they did it on the first the time when johnny oduya was here magical it was out skipping the american independence day to come to bangkok cool so i um yeah i took my kids i was like oh well, let's it was on a saturday i thought well let's go you know because we're usually back in the states over the summer so that's okay. not really an issue so it was at patina school here and um as we're walking in and they're handing all the kids American flags as they walk in and my kids are like, yay! This isn't a Thai flag. <laughs> you know, this isn't a Scottish flag either because they were all born in Scotland. Okay. So they're looking at these flags and they're like, oh, there's like lots of dots and like lots of stripes and wait, what is this holiday? And I, I suddenly felt like, oh my gosh, this should be treason. You know, like my kids don't understand Independence Day. So I'm trying to explain it to them and and my daughter, my, my eldest daughter, she's nine, and she says, oh, I understand why we're coming now, Mommy, because you and Daddy are American, but I'm not. I'm Scottish. I'm like, I guess in your defense, there's really not a lot American to them, you know, which is kind of a weird thought when you have expat kids. Yeah. That they've never lived in the country that the passport they're carrying, you know, so it's... It's interesting. It is. It's... It's... You know, especially when we go back and they kind of articulate things. They say little instead of little. They say, I'd like some water instead of water. 
You know, so they will have these little different. At least they pronounce their T's. There's a lot of Brits I know that don't. They say water, little. Yeah, that Cockney accent. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's interesting when you have. You know, they're, they're, even though they're growing up in an international school, an international environment, we don't really know a lot of American families that we associate with. You know, you call yourself a patriot. <laughs> America. So, um, yeah, so I'm trying to explain this to my kids, and they always kind of get teased a bit by my cousins. They're like, wait, what did you just call it? Water? Saturday? You know? <laughs> But I mean, and I always am kind of stressing for them to accentuate the way they say things because when you are in an international setting, uh-huh. people don't understand an American accent necessarily. You know, they'll. Of course, I guess that's not completely true because you have Hollywood movies. So, I stand corrected by myself. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it's it is interesting, like trying to show them, or we go back to to Texas, and my parents have a ranch, and in, in, uh, it's called the Hill Country, and it's literally in the middle of nowhere. Okay. So it's in a town that I'm not even sure they have a population. Okay. Unincorporated. I think it's about 20 people. Yeah, it's a, what they call unincorporated. Maybe. Yeah. And they live outside of that. Okay. So they literally live in the middle of nowhere, which okay. is really kind of cool especially after you've been in Bangkok for so many years. Yeah. You kind of crave that like I don't hear anything. But um yeah, and you see the stars. And I remember the first time my kids looked up at the sky and they saw the stars. They were like, <laughs> they couldn't believe it. You know? Yeah, it's, it is interesting. The, I, see, in Minnesota, I got, not only did I get to see stars, I got to see northern lights. That's cool. Yeah. I remember seeing those for the first time in Alaska. It was like, I feel like there should be some Pink Floyd music playing somewhere. Yeah. And there wasn't, and I was disappointed. So... To get back on track here a little bit, you're a lot like Lance. You like to you kind of go off on these these tangents, which is cool. I love it. Um, but how do you go from Texas mm. to Bangkok? Well, I got married and followed my husband's job. Okay, and his his job is here in Bangkok. Well, no, actually, it used to be, and then um, back in 2015, so the end of 2015. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, that that whole year, the oil industry was just tanking. They were laying off so many people. So I think in his company alone, they laid off over 30,000 people. Wow. Just in his company. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, So every month, you know, and these aren't people who screw up on the job, like accidentally drop a tool on somebody's head and get decapitated. I mean, these are just guys who are like, yeah, you're putting us in the red. Sorry. You know? Yeah. And, and uh, if, if the company's losing money, they got to do something. No, I totally understand. But this is the very inhuman world that we've created for ourselves. You know, we're, we're, you're literally on the chopping block for no reason. So, I mean, every month it was just, it was a very stressful year. You can't year. say no reason because... Well, it's all money-driven, for sure. Okay, exactly. And that's the society that we have created, and that's the society yeah. we have to, to live with. If yeah. we want to change it, we need to change it. But yeah. nobody wants to change it because they want the money. Yeah, no, it is. Oh, it's an interesting. It's a, yeah, it's an interesting paradox. But so, at the end of 2015, pretty much all the drilling here stopped. Okay. So we knew by the end of the year there was not going to be any more work in Bangkok. And okay. we're like, Kh. and um, so he got transferred to Kazakhstan, mm-hmm. and I'm like, we have to go to Kazakhstan, <laughs> but um. It's even worse than that because it's on a rotation schedule. So he's four weeks on, four weeks off. So, and we can't even It's if better we, than Alaska. Well, was that like six weeks? Six months. Oh, God, that's awful. Yeah, I don't know how, I don't think, I don't think they no, would no, do that. No, no, sorry, it's, I don't think it's six months, but I know, I know some, knew some people that, I forget how long it was, but it's like they would work for six months. Yeah. And then they'd go on holiday for six months. Well, because they have to work when there's ice. Because yeah. these trucks will actually go across the yeah. ice. So they won't do it during the summer because right. there's there's all the, the mud and stuff like that. So they can't get these huge equipment trucks through. Hmm. But, um, yeah, so we got this this transfer. And, unfortunately, it's, it's kind of in the situation where you can't turn it down. Mm-hmm. Ordinarily, they could say, hey, you're going to Sudan. And we could be like, hey funny because we're probably not going to do that 
But if you want to keep your job when everybody else is getting laid off, you right. kind of... Yeah, understandable. Yeah. Okay. So it was really unfortunate, but... Um, yeah, so he's been doing that now for a year and a half, and it's he's going back on Monday. And, you know, and he hates it because he's living in this rotation village, and it's all yeah. people that are just... So it's not a family location. So even if you wanted to have your family sent there, it's not... They don't have accommodation for families. Right. So you have to just do this transfer. Okay. But, um, yeah, so that made it that made it difficult. I know it's hard for him because he misses the kids. He misses being back here. I'm sure he misses me, too. At least that's what he tells you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, and it is hard, but at the so same is time... So is he a driller or what is... No, he's an engineer. Okay. So, um, but, yeah, I think at this point... The way I always see it is I think, well, you know, we could be out of a job. Exactly. So it's unfortunate for the time being, but here we are. And it it did actually give us a bit more time here in Bangkok because, like I said, we lived in Scotland for five years. And I think five years you feel like you've had a home somewhere. Mm -hmm. Anything shorter than that and you don't really quite feel like you've ever put roots down, you know? I would say yes and no to yeah. that statement. Go ahead. Um, well, I lived in, in uh, Pennsylvania yep. for 12 years. Okay. Never felt like home. Well, yeah. I mean, just because you live in a place. Or it feels like, you know, you have your network, right? Mm -hmm. You have your, your community that you build up. You have, you know where the grocery store is. You know where yep. the hardware store is. You know where, you know, whatever else. The good schools are for your kids or whatever. Right. So, you know it in the, it's home in the sense that you've, you've established your yeah, you've established your roots. Doesn't I didn't ever think that Scotland felt like home because it was so cold all the time. <laughs> oh. You don't know what cold is. <sighs> okay, one year in May, it snowed. I cried. I, like, I can't believe it. I call my mom. My mom is the worst person to talk to if you want comfort. Okay. <laughs> She's like, oh, you chose like, this life. <laughs> I'm like, Mom, it's snowing. She's like, Oh, that doesn't sound so bad, Rachel. Oh, you'd hate it here. It's so hot. I can't cool off. I have to go swimming. I'm like, I hate you. I'm sure you could have could have gone swimming if you wanted. Well, these Scots will go swimming in the North Sea. Exactly. Yeah, but they also wear skirts. So I mean, it's not a skirt. It's a kilt. It's a freaking skirt. Okay. It's a kilt. And they're free balling underneath too, which I guess kind of makes it pretty cool in a way. Cause like only like seriously cool men could probably pull that off. <laughs> All right, I retract that statement too. <laughs> okay, so now let's uh, get into why I have you on the show. How did you get into freelance writing? Well, when I was a kid, mm -hmm. my parents asked me that you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Question. And I was always a writer, like. From the time that I could form words on a page, I was writing. So, okay. and I got one of those really cool pens that has all the multicolors, you yeah. know? And I get these well, the spiral... Well, for me, the originals were red, blue, and black. Yeah. I think mine may, might have had pink. Okay, of Yeah, course. I think they were only like the four colors. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I'd have my little cool pen, and I'd get my spiral notebook, and I'd write my table of contents, and I'd just fill it out with stories. So I was doing this even from when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. So my parents come to me with this, what do you want to be when you grow up question? Like, I want to be a writer. Interesting. So what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> like, whatever you want me to be, I guess, because a writer's not good enough. But now I understand because it's a thankless, horrible job. <laughs> Debatable. I mean, I, I love it, but... Yeah, you know, my husband and I were actually having a conversation about this the other night, and I, I said like it's so frustrating because I write these screenplays or I write novels or I write you know whatever else, and it might be something that you're very passionate about writing, but somebody else might pick it up and be like, "Gosh, that was so good." Okay, you have anything else? You know, because it's not what they want. Okay. You know, and and you really do as an artist of any form, it's not about what you're good at or what you're passionate about, and unless you do something incredibly some incredible breakthrough of like music or some writing style like Hemingway, you know, or they don't really like, Oh, but nobody else writes quite like that. So maybe you shouldn't be that innovative because it's just weird. You know what I mean? It, well, 
Okay, I, I'm also a writer. Yeah. Okay, I write poems. I write short stories. I'm, I'm not. Sorry. I love it. And to be, I do too. I, 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 do. I do. To be absolutely honest, I learned when I was in junior high, you cannot write for somebody else. Yeah. No, okay. I still don't. I'm pretty stubborn about that. You know, and yeah. I have a certain like writing style, and then. My my wife, I love her. She said, "Well, nobody writes like that, so you have to change your writing style for, if you want to publish a book." And I was like, "Okay, well, fine." And so I had to relearn how to write, which is okay. That's fine. I have yeah, no problem with yeah. that. And then somebody published a book that wrote the way I used to write, <sighs> but that's okay. I mean, I'm more about. I definitely have idea. I have like a few novels that are kind of in works that I go back to from time, yeah, time to time. But mostly I write like short stories, poems, although I haven't, since I've started, been doing my poem. You have work. Pen. I'd love, I'd be quite It's been a long time since I've written anything, but. Well, come on. Your, your writing's I, your I mean, writing. Yeah. You know, my first, my first novel, like official novel I wrote, I was 12. And, um, okay. and it was about this expedition team in the Amazon. Hmm. And they come across this hidden cave. And they go through the cave, and it opens up into this, like, mythical fantasy world, you know? And, um, yeah, and I, I have to, I, I actually need to go back and read it, just because I'm kind of curious what it says now. But, um, yeah, like, it was all about centaurs and cyclops and all this, you know, with That's your awesome. unicorn story. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, it was cool. And then, so it was always driven by... For me, it was always very much a cathartic thing, mm -hmm. you know? I can understand. So I didn't keep journals. I would put my thoughts into a, this microcosm or this, this, this macrocosm of a world that I would be writing, you know? And that was kind of how I would vent about some issue that was bothering me is that I'd write a whole story about it, you know? I can understand. Just, I, used to, I used to do... That's how I used yeah. to write poetry. Okay. I'm, and my poems... <laughs> It used to. It frustrated me for a long time because I'm not the type of poet that I am. I'm not a rhymer. Okay? Yeah. And I well, remember. Well, unless you're Dr. Seuss. It's well, no, like, no, 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 not even like that. But like I read, Robert Frost had. had yeah. He's very structured in how he writes his poetry. Right. And he said, "If you don't rhyme, it's not worth it." And although I still love to write, and I write for myself. Yeah. It's been like. That always kind of hung over me for a long time because yeah. I, but I've had fortunately I've had some very good friends that are also writers that have corrected my thinking in that aspect. So yeah, but for me when it comes to writing, I write for myself. Yeah, but if somebody says, "Oh, I like your work," that's like, "Oh, okay, thanks." Yeah, yeah. But for me, what I want them to do is, is what does whatever it is that I've written that they're reading, what does it make them think? What does it make them feel? And if yeah. they can tell me that, that's even, for me, that's an even bigger compliment. Yeah. No, I agree. And I um, I have a producer friend that, that I met when I was in L.A. pitching two of my scripts. And um, I remember he, he produced one film that was, it was very much an indie film. You know, it's not something that you'd see in a big theater. It was, it was you know, the pace was quite slow. It was definitely more of a statement about a situation. You know exactly what you're mm -hmm. saying. And um, it was... So I, I did a big critique on it afterwards. I, I gave him a bunch of feedback because he had read one of my scripts and gave me some feedback on it. And um, so when I, was, when I was watching this and I'm writing my feedback, um, there were certain things like, you know, you use a lot of reds or you use a lot of... Because it was about this, this Chinese woman who's in Chinatown in L.A. And she's never actually left Chinatown. Okay. Because she was kind of smuggled over there for family money and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So in, throughout all of the movie, everything feels like you're in a prison. Okay. You know, even your, your beautiful view outside the window is obstructed by a building and then, like, you know, the, the iron rods across the window. Right. So, you know, you start picking up on that kind of stuff. So it's more of an artistic expression rather than, you know, The Avengers, number right. 69. Like so many Avengers movies, come on, stop making them. It's like Friday the Thirteenth. How many were there? Thirteen? No, there wasn't thirteen. I believe there was seventeen. I'd have to go back and 17? check. Seventeen? Yeah, I think so. That's like a movie series. Good lord. Well, it's like um, what is it? The Fast and the Furious. Yeah. What number are they on now? Like seventy-three. They just did Fate. Fate. F8. Oh my god. I love it. 
I just can't even. <laughs> it's a great movie. So, okay. So, you you write novels. Yeah. You write screenplays. Yep. What else do you write? Um, well, I did a lot of poetry for a while. I was actually writing an anthology of poetry, and I was taking each particular poetic style mm-hmm. and format, and okay. I would try to write a poem in each style. Okay. So there's one, just to give you an example, there's one poetic format called a sestina. Mm-hmm. So you have, it's... I think it's six stanzas. Okay. So let's say, okay, and you pick out six words. So A, B, C, D, E, F. And you write your line and you use, so on each, there's six lines to each stanza. Uh So you use each word at the end of each stanza. Uh But then on the next one, the first word becomes the last one. The last one becomes the first one and you swap them up. So it's a very particular style where you're flipping up these words at the end but you have to end each each line of each stanza with these exact six words in this particular order okay and then at the end it's three lines and it's you have to use two of the words in each line okay so you know i wrote one in that one um oh there's lots of them but i yeah so i was trying to pick out like i don't know 10 or 20 different poetic styles and then just write poems within those formats because if I know that I have a particular parameter I have to work within, Mm -hmm. like writing a screenplay, for example, you have a maximum of 120 pages. You cannot go over, I mean, unless you're Quentin Tarantino or, you know, somebody awesome like that. I don't know if you can say Quentin Tarantino's awesome. He's kind of weird. Anyway. Sometimes weird makes you awesome. Well, obviously. I'm proud of being different. Yeah. What was my, I used to have a little button on my backpack that says, I'm not weird, I'm gifted. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. You can throw that one out next time. So, um, yeah, unless you're like a really renowned screenwriter or a producer or something like that, you usually don't ever want to deviate over 120 pages because okay. most producers will be like, oh, I don't like reading and you just made me read more than I needed to, you know? And so the, the formatting has to be absolutely precise or they will just immediately put it in the round file, you okay. know? That's it. They won't you will never hear the light of day from them again. So I I like that because it forces me to have to work within really strict parameters. And then I know what I'm working with. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's like, go write a novel about what anything you want. It's like, Oh my God, what is that? I don't know. What could I write about? I could write about anything. I mean, it seems it should be liberating, but it's really not. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Speaking about poetry, I, I can't tell you different styles of poetry because that's not what I do yeah when I write a poem the way it comes out on paper is how it comes out of my head yeah once I start crafting it yeah it loses every sense of meaning that I had I've done it I've tried it yeah so and it to me it just it loses its essence yeah so I don't craft my poems when the way they come out it's like I kind of the way I phrase it is I regurgitate on the paper well, I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that's how my, that's how my poetry is. Yeah. No, so. and I can understand that too, because I think that, that each different poetic style that you have is kind of going to, it is going to kind of mirror a particular style of what you're writing about. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you're writing something in iambic pentameter, for example, I mean, that's going to usually just be limited to a certain style, you know, rhyming for a certain style, freelance, like or uh, freestyle, free form and all this, that's going to be more for just, you know, that stream of conscious type, mm-hmm. type ideas. But yeah, I don't know. It, I like doing it because it challenges me as a writer to have okay. to, to have to work within certain things. So I can understand that. Yeah. And I, I, I really quite liked that about screenwriting because it was, it was so specific that it, I felt that it made me write better because What they'll say, like, what I have a screen consultant here. She's my editor here in Bangkok. And um, she says, you have to actually see the action on the page. So I can't be like, he felt very sad. You have to show me how does he feel sad because Mm -hmm. he's banging his head on a wall. You know what I mean? Or something like that. So show, don't tell. How can you, how can you personify that mood for that character? Okay. And, you know, you only have about two lines of narrative description. So... Mm -hmm. It's very, very succinct writing, but you have to learn, you know, 
I know verbs now that before I wouldn't really use in language, you know, because I would use maybe more like, I don't know, d different ones, you know, more feeling or something like that. Okay. But you have to use action verbs and stuff. So you really can play around with, with your own abilities. It's, it's quite, it, it is as challenging as a writer, and I like that. Okay, yeah. interesting. So have you ever had one of your screenplays picked up? Not yet, but I've got, um, I just got back this reading list from all these different, um, from all these different studios that have read one of my big, it's my big war epic script that I wrote. And, um, one of them was Scott Free Productions, which is Ridley Scott's studio. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm, I need to follow up with that. And, um, there were a lot of other ones, but the problem with, with particularly that war epic story is that. I mean, it's a huge budget film, which me being an unknown in the movie film industry, it's kind of like, why should I invest a hundred million dollars into your script? You know, understandable. You know, and and you do have to pitch, and when you go to pitch to producers, you have five minutes, okay. which means you need to sell them in about a minute and a half, literally. So it's a really daunting thing trying to pitch in front of these producers. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it is it kind of. It makes it fun, but at the same time, you know, the networking and all that of, of pitching is, is fun, but it's very difficult. I mean, because okay. you go to these pitch fests and stuff, and you're just in this room with 500 other people. Who are doing the same who thing. Who are doing the same thing. You yeah. know, the producers, you can just see at the end of the day, their eyes are like glazing over. <laughs> you know, and I could totally understand why, but um, yeah, so you have to be really, really, really motivated to want to make it in Hollywood. So... I have a question for you then. I might have an answer. I'm sure you do. Um, why not take one of your stories, modernize them a little bit to modern time instead of, you and I have talked before, you like writing war stories. Yeah. But make it a bit more modern, lower the budget, produce it yourself. I don't know anything about how to make a movie. I would be completely, no, it just wouldn't do it justice. I just don't think it would. It depends on how you work on it. Well, I guess. Okay, project. You got cameras and stuff like that. There we go. Awesome. Let's deal. I mean, it, it's a it's a possibility. I mean, it's. I mean, I don't know. Like, I know I follow a few YouTubers, and one of the people I I follow, he he writes scripts, mm -hmm. but he also produces a lot of his own stuff. And he, okay. He like uses. He uses his phone for some cam for, for some really? videoing. Cool. He uses GoPros. He uses handheld camcorders. He uses big production cameras. Oh wow! It you know you use and his big thing is you use what you've got. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I mean I I uh I don't actually we had a video camera growing up and when did Waterworld come out? Was that like ninety ninety? You, you say growing up in 94, and I was like in my 20s. <laughs> okay, so let's see. What was When did that come out? Whenever it was. I don't remember, but something about that, I kind of liked that looking, like the kind of searching, you know, you don't really know. It's the, the unknown and all this kind of stuff. I didn't, but you can do that. Yeah, but I remember actually with my sister, you know, I'd always, I have four sisters, and I always bullied them and... Well, that doesn't surprise me. I was. I'm still the bully. Uh, like, no, again, hey, that doesn't game. surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> I've been on the ice with you. It doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, my sisters all know that about me. But, um, yeah, so I used to kind of bully him into submission. Like, you're going to act in my movie. This is what you're going to say. He'd be like, I don't want to do it anymore. Shut up and do it. You know? <laughs> so I had my own rendition of Waterworld that we did. Okay. And I don't know what happened to that movie. No clue. But yeah, I did have an attempt at that one time. I had a baby doll, and I put a little... I taped a little tattoo on the back like they had in that okay. movie. <laughs> Interesting. It kept falling off, I remember. And we had this game room closet. It was this huge closet. It was actually probably about the size of this room. And um, we could... It was never clean. It was just like... Just a tornado just hit that one room, you know? It was just disaster. So... Um, I motivated myself enough to clean it out because that's where I was going to shoot my film. That was like my house. And I okay. I remember my mom came upstairs and she's like, okay, clean up for... And she's like, the game room closet's clean. I'm like, shh, we're filming. 
<laughs> That's actually kind of awesome. Yeah, I have no. I would but love to see that. Why not do more of that? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm being absolutely dead serious. I mean, you love writing scripts. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure we, you know, people that would love to to give a shot at acting. Cameras Do my nowadays. Count? What's that? Do my children count? They act up all the time. Well, uh, acting up is different. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I I know I know people who would love to be participate in something like that. Hmm. Um. And cameras are so cheap nowadays. Yeah, that's true. And they're, true. they're good quality. I mean, to be totally honest, my I film my, my most of my podcasts now on two GoPros. But I also use... Is that what these ones are? That, that, these are them. And I use... I have a Nikon DSLR that I do some videoing okay. with. I actually have a... What is mine? An Nikon uh, D90? Okay. I think. They might have, I have a video. I have like the paparazzi it, lens. Yeah, it might have a, a video option on it. I'm not sure, depending on how old do. it is. Some of them Must, do. Yeah. Um, you know, plus you have your phone. Why Wait, not? my phone? That's probably not a good example. I'm, I'm, tell of, you, I'm, I'm kind of a I'm dinosaur with my you, phone. <laughs> does it have a camera? Well, that's debatable. But I mean, why not do it? I mean, it's it make to me well, it makes sense. Well, because I never talked to you about it before. Okay, now you talked to me. Anyway. What's what's our movie? What's the script? Okay, right, you have to write the we script. Well, I'll, I'll be totally honest. When Pitch I me an started, idea. I'll write it. When I started podcasting, yeah. What I did is I went and found out what I needed to do yeah. to do my own podcast. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm inspired. So I do all my own editing. And I started off just with audio, and then my yeah. wife videoed me ice skating. I rented skates and went to Central World and skated for the first time in almost 30 years. Wow. And it was like, it was so much fun. Yeah. Um, and that inspired me to start videoing my shows. Cool. Okay, so I do all the video for my shows. I do all the editing. Now, granted, it's not nothing, anything spectacular, but it's a learning process. Oh, for sure. Do you know what I mean? And I love learning. I love learning how yeah. to edit in different ways. Well, this is actually when I started screenwriting. It was like this. I remember I brought my, um, I brought my first script to my editor, and I was like, "Here you go. It's solid gold. This baby's gonna sell like tomorrow for sure." And she read it. She's like, "I think you should probably try and make this into a novel instead." It's like, what do you mean it's perfect. How can you <laughs> say that? It's golden. Remember. She's like, N -n 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 -n. but there are some novelists who write to get their novels yeah, produced into movies. Yeah, but see, I don't know. I'm kind of because again, going back to the whole poetry formats, they're such different mediums yes, in a novel. They are. Okay, here's a perfect example: Absolutely. 1984. Yeah. You could not convert that into a film. They did because it's I know, and it was a total flop. Because how it, can you get? It's a cult classic. Is it? Have you watched it? No, I just cannot oh my imagine. God. Because it the is whole thing so... is about like, like, what is it? Um, it still thought, resonates thought. with today. Yeah. Especially well, yeah. with, with, especially with the, what's going on in countries around the world yeah. right now. It, you, you've got to sit down and watch it. Wasn't it, was it like the, when did it come out in the 70s? No, it came out in 1984. Did it? I think so. Yeah, oh, I'd have to. I'd have to look it up. I think they did it. They did that on purpose. But I would hope so. It is. It is a very dark and dirty movie. But see, just the format, like the yeah. book. But the format is so different because when you're reading the novel, you're inside of Wilson's head. Absolutely. You can't show that the same way on you, screen. You can't. But yeah. they did a great job of bringing it to the screen. I'm going to have to watch that, and then we're going to come back it. and debate this again. Okay. I'm going to give Absolutely. you my movie critic feedback of 1984. So, okay, more about writing. You, I think, if I remember correctly, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, which I'm sure you will, you have written, <laughs> you've written a book and, and had it published. No. I thought you wrote a cookbook. Oh, yes. That's yeah. that book? <laughs> Sorry, I had, to, I had to think twice about that one. Yeah, I wrote a cookbook. Okay, and, and you got it published. Yeah, that all started basically on, it was, <laughs> I have all these food intolerances, so uh -huh. I am extremely limited in pretty much everything on God's green earth. So when I first found out the bulk of my intolerances, I was like, but I like to eat, and now I can't anymore. So I thought, well, I have to find a way 
you know, to get okay. nourishment into my body. And eating the grass outside my garden is probably not going to cut it. No. So our our appendixes aren't designed that way anymore. No, they have changed yeah, over the years. Not. But so basically, my dietary restrictions are: I can't have any grains, no nuts, no seeds, no eggs, no dairy. Like all the good stuff. You can have meat. No nope. meat. You can't have. Oh, meat. meat. Yeah, I can have meat. I thought you said beans. No meat. No, I can't have meat. Legumes. Is good. Meat. Yes, yes. <laughs> I l- I live on meat. So I went out. Where was I? Just recently, I went out to a steak dinner, and they're like, "How do you want your steak cooked? Rare. I need all the iron I can get." <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and they they bring it out. And I think it was still mooing as it came to my table. Okay. Oh, so it, yeah. At it was, least it's it was, not a Pittsburgh. No, well, it was it was amazing. It was delicious, but um, yeah. So I can pretty much have meat, fruit, and vegetables. Okay, so you wrote a cookbook because I was just desperate to find good. I, I'm, I love food. I love okay. eating. I eat, like literally eight meals a day. I seriously. Understand. Okay. So for me, I, I just I wanted to find a way that basically it started as just like I was compiling all these recipes, uh-huh. and I thought, well, I might as well just organize it a little bit okay and then after i did that i was like well i should probably put some pictures in there maybe i'll go ahead and like categorize it and should probably do a table of contents and maybe an index and, and here's where the should writer probably have an in. appendix section with like all of the you know f- nutrition facts of how to make bone broth and you know so it just kind of grew arms and legs and then now i have this 300 page cookbook. as <laughs> as the writer in you takes over yeah yeah it does that from time to time okay so how did you go about getting it published well, I'm doing it through. Um, it's it's just through online stuff. Okay, so, so it's an ebook. Moment. Yeah. Okay. How, yeah. What did you? Do, how did you do it? I actually sent it all to my uncle because he's done a lot of stuff through Amazon, and okay. I've done I've done um, editing with him before. We've worked on a couple of books together before. Okay. Um, and so I don't. This is all just very very recent. Okay. So it's. I'm not, not going to ask you for any figures or yeah, anything. Yeah. Like no, 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 so. no. It's not about that. It's just it's all very recent. So I, I'm not. I don't know how much it's really up and running in the marketplace on Amazon. I don't know. Well, what's the title of it? And then if I can find it on Amazon, I will absolutely put a link into my show notes on the video. All right. Yeah, well, I've I've actually taken it off because I'm doing a new version. You should have left the original up until the new one was ready. But see, I'm kind of a perfectionist like that. I I can absolutely understand that. No, I can't have this one out right now because I'm making one better. But you need, it's going to have to be under a different um, ISBN. Mm. So okay. that's why you. Because it is quite that. different. I'm changing that's, it quite a bit. So put it back up. Okay. So what's it called? Well, that was just the Beard Cookbook. Okay. All right. <laughs> not I'll, very, not if very. If I can creative. find it on Amazon, I'll absolutely put a link in the show notes. Cool. So. Okay. Yeah, the other one that I did, because it's. It, the one is called, it's a very strict version of the paleo diet. Okay. Um, so it's called AIP, which is autoimmune protocol. And uh-huh. um, so I just have that it. That sounds like a, a like, uh, I'm ex-military. When you start hearing things like protocol, it's like, Ugh. all it's, right, it's the regiment. shit's hitting the fan. Well, you know, kind of when you're as restricted to life as I am. Yeah. But you know what? I can make some awesome dessert of like fried bananas drizzled with honey. It's amazing. I know, I think, I'm a I think, glutton. I think my wife actually made something very similar to really? that when I came back from the States. Um, it was it was really good. And she did something with apples, something very similar. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so good. Oh, I could, I could, well, I've had to. I've had to learn how to be creative, you know, yeah. and I, I use my um, slow cooker. Okay. So I have a lot of recipes. That are is, slow it a cooker slow cooker recipes. is it a slow cooker or is it a crock pot? Crock pot? Crock. Crack. Pot. Not crack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, crock pot. Yeah! Woohoo! No. <laughs> no. Dinner's on me tonight, guys, in the crack pot. Um, no, I think... No, I don't I don't know what the difference is. What okay. is the difference? Is that like a British-English... I don't know. In, in Minnesota, we had crock pots. Is that like a boot versus a trunk? No, I, I don't know. I think a, a slow cooker, it, it, it's... It, a slow cooker has a pressure, like a valve on it. Whereas like a crock pot, you just uh, set the thing on the, the I don't know. on top. I don't know. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. I'll have to. Hmm. I'll, I'll probably put something in here if or I'm complete. Yes. I could be way, way wrong. So, but anyway. Oh yeah, I'm not really sure. I have. I don't know. I thought it was just one of those, you know, okay. translations of. Could be. Could just be absolutely be that. Like something from 
northern United States to southern United States. No. We all got a slow crook cookbook <laughs> here. A slow we talk mm-hmm. slow to go with our slow cooker. Yeah, exactly. Well, we talk slow in Minnesota, too. So. Yeah. Well, I actually never had a crock pot slash slow cooker until about two years ago. And okay. now, I actually make my family was eating my slow cooker chicken. Yeah. It's amazing. Cool. It's okay. I'll send you the recipe. Oh, we oh, yeah, oh. absolutely. We can. It takes literally like 45 and a half seconds to put together, and it cooks for four hours. And it's We like, need to get a slow cooker, then. It's amazing. They're like a thousand baht. Yeah. You know, we, we've looked at them. So, all right. So, I'm gonna end this because we're we're running close to an hour, which is really cool. But I have this thing that I do at the end of every podcast, um, and I forgot to to warn you with this. I do a thing that's called Always Remember, where I like to leave my guest or not my guest. I like to leave my audience with something kind of positive or something like uplifting or something to think about. Okay. And I call it Always Remember. But the the trick is, or the the key here is. When I have a guest on, I like to have my guest do the always remember. Now, one person one time has said no. That was my wife. Now, she has been on the show She's more like, than once. I live once. with you. I will always remember. Okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but now, she has been on the show more than once. Okay. And she has since done the always remember. But okay. one time, she said no. But if you want to say no, you're more than welcome to say no. I would appreciate it if you did the always remember, though. You're stumping me. Always remember what? Like anything, po- anything positive or upbeat. I mean, you know, something about writing. If you want, you know, some anybody mm-hmm. who's looking at, like they they want to get into writing. Like my daughter is into writing. Okay. Yeah. So, what is something that you could tell somebody who is a fledgling writer that fledgling will writer. encourage them to stick it out? Keep doing that because. That is your expression, your catharsis. That is your that is your ability to get what's here that you can't actually do or think or say in real she life. She pointed to her head for that. Um. <laughs> it is videoed, but I don't know if some people don't listen. Oh, okay. They just listen okay. and don't watch. Yeah, so I think I think for anybody out there writing, it is very difficult in the sense that there are a lot of times that you're not going to feel appreciated or your work's not going to go represented well. But everything that you do, everything that you write, you're, you're perfecting your craft a little bit more. Okay. And you're perfecting your ability as a writer more and kind of, yeah, just getting more inside of yourself. And you start, you start coming up with ideas that you never knew were there. And it's, it's a really interesting journey you can find yourself on. So, Excellent. yeah. All right. Thank you very much for being on the show. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye-bye. Please rate my show or leave a comment or make suggestions of what you would like me to talk about. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Dom Dumas, on Twitter at Dom Dumas, or on Instagram, Dom underscore Dumas. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.